This is the first coin brief interview that we are having with a prominent member of the Bitcoin community. Uh, this is Eric Voorhees. He's a, a startup founder, um, founded Coinapult, as well as Satoshi Dice. Uh, have you done anything else uh, that you want to add to your, your resume for this? Uh, I was with BitInstant for about a year as the head of marketing before uh, starting Coinfold down in Panama. Very nice, very nice. And um, so the main thing that we're going to talk about today is the bit license proposal for regulations that have happened in New York. Um, so you've, you've, you've read the, the, the basics of this by now, have you? Yeah, I waded through all 40 pages of it a few times. Okay, okay. And um, I read your, your article on your blog, and it was a, it was a very good article. Uh, you made some really great points um, about the, the financial privacy of Bitcoin transactions and, and what regulation could mean for privacy in the Bitcoin, in the, in the Bitcoin world. Um, what, what, are you, what is your greatest concern about privacy concerning the bit license? Uh, concern is essentially that uh, any user of any Bitcoin service uh, would have to be entered into all sorts of databases with their name and personal information like where they live, uh, what they look like, um, you know, what nationality they are, probably scans of their passport or driver's license. And so this is all just a bunch of personal information that other people have no business knowing. Um, and if, if the government wants to have private information about people, they need to make a case that that person is at least a suspect of a crime, I would think. They shouldn't be able to just require everyone's information uh, just because they write it on paper. So that was, that was my, main, my main concern. There, you know, there are other concerns, but that was kind of the thrust of my, my piece. Yeah, yeah, focusing on the, on the privacy issue. So they're, they're, pretty, they're required to basically record all transactions that happen within that particular financial institution. Is that right? And 10 years of records of all business transactions... Um, is that something that, that, that banks and other financial institutions are normally like um, subject to? Or is, is that like a specific like, attack on Bitcoin that isn't really leveled against anyone else in the, in the finance industry? I'm guessing that, that banks are probably supposed to take a, keep their records for 10 years or something like that. I don't, I don't know. I'm just guessing. Um, but, you know, there's lots of things that you can do with normal money that you don't need to betray all your personal information about, right? If you go buy some uh, some snacks at the grocery store with with cash, the grocery store owner doesn't bring out a form and require you to fill out your name and address and give them a scan of your of your passport and a photo and all that stuff just to just to buy a five dollar snack. Um, so why is that freedom permitted with dollars, but not with Bitcoin? Someone who wants to buy five dollars worth of Bitcoin, according to these New York rules, is going to have to give up all the information that they would have to give up if they were to open a, a bank account or, or buy a house or, you know, so the, it's just um, completely inappropriate. Yeah. Do you th like, is, is, is this something that they've been waiting to do for a while in terms of currency? Because they can't, they can't track uh, cash, dollars, transactions like this, obviously. It's just pa pieces of paper. Is Bitcoin, are they kind of trying to use this as their opportunity to, like, create, a, you know, a perfectly trackable system of, of money um, and, and basically trying to co-opt the Bitcoin system for their own surveillance purposes. Yeah, I mean, these agencies, of course, want to surveil everything. Um, that's, you know, they believe that that's, they believe that they're good people and that they need to watch over society and keep it safe. So they don't seem to have any, uh, any sort of limit on what they want to watch. They think that they can watch whatever they want. They're good people. They will treat that information well. And thus, anyone complaining probably is just a, a bad guy with something to hide. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I mean, th this is exactly what the premise of that wonderful book, 1984, was about. Uh, you know, a, a state that, uh, in order to watch over the flock, is able to, to view everything about everyone at all times. People are not allowed to question this. Uh, and... You know, I think most of us grew up seeing that book as something that that we didn't want to happen, uh, and that we we're like, oh well, clearly that's bad. Thank goodness our government is not like that, and and let's um, let's not ever let that happen. 
But this is exactly how that does happen. It happens with these little steps. Each, you know, each little piece of regulation that asks for more and more information in, in wider areas of our lives. And so we, we just are marching toward a situation of 1984 willingly. And um, it's bad enough that that's how it is in the normal financial system. But now we have a way to escape that, to avoid it, to turn the clock back on this terrible surveillance state. And uh, New York comes in and wants to, wants to prevent that from happening. They want to gather us all up together in, in all their databases and it needs to be fought in every way possible. Yeah. And and they're doing it under the guise of consumer protection. Saying that, you know, this Bitcoin thing, these virtual currency things, they're dangerous for consumers. Uh, you know, they're too volatile. You might get hacked too easily. The business you're working with might go under or might steal the coins or whatever. So they're doing it under the guise of, of protecting consumers and, and making sure that, you know, everyone's safe in this brand new financial world. But... Uh, you make the argument in your article that it's not actually about consumer protection and that once consumers give up all their information like this, they're actually more vulnerable because their information is all out there on a server somewhere. And then it's way too easy to have that hacked or stolen, you know, more easy than, yeah. than if they had just not given up that information in the first place. Yeah. Like ignore Bitcoin for a second. People shop online for all sorts of stuff and they have to give up all this personal information when they go shopping with, with every merchant. Um, and the identity theft and credit card fraud that derives from that is massive. It's a huge industry um, of crime because the information is out there for the criminals to get and they will figure out ways to get it. Uh, the Target data breach, you know, last Christmas was a really good example of this where, you know, tens of millions of customers had their information stolen from them because they all use credit cards and Target has to store that information. And that, that is the very opposite of protecting consumers. You shouldn't need to reveal personal private information about yourself to buy things, especially if you're not being suspicious, if you're not under suspicion of a, of a crime or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. It's absurd. Yeah, they're just cast, so, yeah. They're casting a huge wide net across everyone. Yeah. Yeah, they, they just want to wanna watch everyone. They don't want Bitcoin to be invisible. They don't want this new technology to come out that allows people privacy from, from the state. They, they, they don't believe that, that that's a valid desire. Right, right. Because they're in government, right? Like they, they think that their job is to protect everyone from everyone else. And in order to achieve that, they have to watch every single little thing that happens uh, between people in terms of virtual currency and Bitcoin. Yeah, and a lot of it is that they resort to, I don't know what we can call the... Uh, but because Gox reason. Mm. So they can throw out any rule they want. And if you say, well, what, why that rule? They say, well, because Gox. Right? Because Gox happened. Because Mount Gox collapsed, a bunch of people lost a bunch of money. Because there was shady stuff that went on, and it wasn't regulated, and all this stuff, blah, blah, blah. Because of that, clearly, uh, we need to come in uh, as your parents and take down your names and keep track of you and put a little tracking device on everything you do, monitor who you are, where, where you are, what you're saying, what you're buying, uh, all this stuff because because of Gox, because we're going to prevent Goxes from happening. And of course, this is totally ridiculous because financial frauds happen in the normal financial industry all the time. Uh, you know, Bernie Madoff is kind of the the poster child of that. He used to work for the for a lot of these regulation agencies. I mean, he was in the he was in the regulators in high positions, and he devised you know the worst scam of our time. Uh, so why we should trust these people to pre protect us from scams, they haven't made a very good Yeah, they haven't made a very, very, they don't have a very good resume of actually doing the things that they claim that they're supposed to do to protect people. <laughs> yeah, and, I mean, I guess they don't need to make arguments, right, because they have, they have the gun. They can always throw you in prison. That's their argument. The argument is do what we say or else we will hurt you, we will steal your property, we'll ruin your life, and we'll make everything hell for you. So that's their argument, essentially. Yeah, that's a, that's a fairly compelling argument <laughs> in terms of just physical safety. Yeah. So um, I want to like just go over some of the other things that are a part of this absurd bit license. Um, so the people who run the businesses have to do background checks, submit fingerprints to the FBI. Um, you have to have a bond held with the New, with the New York State. Um, you have to record transactions for 10 years. You can't hold profits in Bitcoin or any vit uh, virtual digital currencies. 
So yeah. they're telling you that I, you can be successful. Just turn your those bitcoins into dollars, which was, was what we use in the banking sector. That was a, a really weird clause, and you know, almost all the other clauses, you can at least understand what the government's argument is, and what they claim. I have no idea what they are thinking with that one. It it doesn't make any sense, and I think it's actually pretty clearly unconstitutional. The government yeah. can't force a company to keep its savings in one form of asset or another. They couldn't tell a company that you must keep your savings in gold or you must keep your savings in you know, uh, bushels of, of wheat. They can't tell you that you must keep your savings in dollars. That I, I've never heard of such a thing. That would that would be completely unconstitutional. Yeah, it seems so I, I think that I think that'll be stricken. That clause will be stricken from the final rules because okay. they they have to understand how absurd that is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if 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 they keep it in, people are just gonna try and keep their Bitcoin profits anyway, or at least a certain fraction of them, and just hide it using tools like Dark Wallet or Coin Join or something else to just to allow them to, to just keep it under the table. New York's not going to put everything yeah, above the table. Yeah, any of these any of these rules will have the effect. They you know they will prevent um, some good people from using it legally and then they will force other people who want to keep using it to go around the law in, in one way or another and it's very easy to do. So all that's gonna happen is move what is a, a wonderful, you know, blooming white market and push it underground. So um, I want to get your opinion on the Bitcoin Foundation's position on this issue. So yeah. Patrick Merck, who is the general counsel of the Bitcoin Foundation, um, he did a couple of tweets when the when the Bit license came out, and he did some interviews too, where he said that um, it, the rules aren't going to work, and and there's privacy implications. And then John Matonis actually did a did um, a nice editorial in CoinDesk talking about the financial or the the privacy implications and actually supporting the tour challenge to to make tour stronger um do you trust the bitcoin foundation on this issue do you think they're actually on the right side of this one because they've been pushing for regulation a lot in the past um sometimes it's not always fair to say that a person or group is pushing for regulation some people are um others feel like it's inevitable and so they want to be proactive and help shape the regulation um, I, I don't think that the foundation is necessarily pro-regulation, you know, if the government was just going to stay the hell out of it, I don't think the Bitcoin foundation would be going to them and saying please, please regulate us I don't think they would do that, I think they see that the government is going to regulate in one way or another and they want to engage with the regulators in order to craft it in, a, in the most beneficial and least harmful way um, I know a few of the people, you know, leading the Bitcoin Foundation, and I, I think they're good people. And I, I generally feel like people should uh, fight against this stuff in lots of ways. Um, so those who want to be political about it, fine. Those who want to ignore it and just keep building their businesses anyway, that's great too. Um, all sorts of tactics are, are needed, I think. Okay, great, great, great. Um, yeah, that brings up the question, like. If, if the bit license is implemented, and let's assume that the majority of, uh, the, of, the, of the rules are kept in the, in the license, um, would, that just, would that just cripple New York in terms of the digital currency ecosystem and the majority of the actually innovative businesses would just operate somewhere else? Yeah, I think, I think the day, if those regulations came into effect tomorrow, I think tomorrow you would find... Uh, quite a few Bitcoin companies with a new message on their homepage if you were visiting from a New York IP address saying, sorry, we're not going to do business with you. Yeah, uh, I think that's going to happen. It's just not worth the time. I mean, New York is a, is a big and important market, but it's not worth you know, burdening your entire business and hamstringing it with, with legal bills and trying to comply with this nonsense. I mean, um, these regulations require you know, the background checks and the bonds and all this stuff. Imagine some kid, some 18-year-old in college who, who writes some Bitcoin software and makes a service for people to start using. I mean, there's no way that he can do it under this, under this regulatory scheme. Yeah, yeah. You'd so, have to hire a compliance officer, cybersecurity officer, <laughs> yeah. the mandate of the state. Yeah, so, so what's, what's this 18-year-old going to do? Well, he can either not build his dream, which I guess is what American politicians seem to be pushing us toward, or he can just say, sorry, New York, 
can't work with you. Mm -hmm. America's a free country, and uh, I have to block you because freedom. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah. and hopefully, you know, enough people will do this that the politicians take notice and New Yorkers take notice, and they realize that they're being ring fenced from uh, the new financial system. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, how, how ironic is that for New York City to become isolated from the future financial system? Yeah. It is the current hub of financial activity in the world, and it is doing everything it can to make sure that it does not participate in the in the next generation of finance. Yeah, that is that is really ironic. Uh, ben Lasky, he's he's trying so hard to like co-opt Bitcoin into the system they have already set up, the legacy financial system. Co-opt it in there, make sure that companies exchange all their Bitcoin for dollars, make sure they can see all the transactions and it's it, it will most likely backfire if they don't do anything to change it. People will just won't yeah. do businesses in, in New York. And customers who actually want to work with Bitcoin businesses out of New York, um, would they just be able to like go through Tor and hide their IP address and still do yeah. the things that they're not allowed to do? Yeah, I mean, look at, um, you know, we, we Americans um, see all these totalitarian countries where uh, they block access to the internet or to certain services or to, um, you know, the New York Times or whatever, so that their people can't see these things online. And we, we revile at that sort of censorship, and we think, oh, that's so terrible to their government. Um, and those people get around those things through, through, right, or through Tor. They, they figure out easy ways to get around these technical blocks, and they participate in the global economy, even though their government doesn't want them to. And I think most Americans are happy that people in these repressed countries do that and that they have these tools to get around the oppression. And then here we are, and we need to look in the mirror ourselves in, this, in, the, in, the, in our country and see the exact same thing happening here and realize that the exact same response is going to happen. People are going to figure out tools to get around it and, and good for them. Yeah. Um, uh, so if bit, less, if bit lessons goes through, we'll be fine. There's still privacy measures people can do to hide their identity to hide their transactions, have privacy still. Um, but for people, if we want to save the people in New York from go having to go through this, do you think, is it, is it worth it to try and email um, Dana Syracuse at, at, D, um, at New York, at the New York website and try and comment on this and try and, try and get it changed? Is it worth engaging with them? Uh, yeah, to, to a point. I mean, I... Um I sent out a, a tweet, you know, with, with her email in it, encouraging people to email her. Um, I've been advocating this uh, petition that people are, have put up to get them to extend the response period by at least another 45 days. Um, so while I detest these people, I still, to some extent, will engage with them and try to be civil and, you know, point out the problems and try to work with them. Um, but I don't think people should waste too much time on it, frankly. And uh, if... If these laws come to pass, I think the better option is simply to block that territory. Um, but, you know, don't don't destroy your business trying to comply with the the diktats of these politicians. You know, try to work with them if they'll be civil and reasonable. But a lot of them are not, and uh, so at, at some point you just gotta keep building. Yeah. So speaking of civility, um, I don't know if you've seen Bruce Fenton's fiery speech that he gave at Coin Congress. Yeah. He got, he got pretty yeah. riled up and started, um, you know, just talking about some of the, he, he, he called Ben Lasky um, violent. He called him a liar um, and a couple of other, other you know, semi-heated uh, words. Um, basically trying to paint him as, as someone who is, who is corrupt, unreliable, and you shouldn't, you sh we shouldn't even, like, like, deal with them on, like, a human level, basically. What do, yeah. you, what do you think? Um, I, I know Bruce. I, I like him. He's a great guy. Um, whether Ben Lasky is those things or not, I, I don't know, and it kind of doesn't matter. I mean, I, I generally give politicians the benefit of the doubt. I don't think they're evil people. I don't think that they're all uh, out there trying to collude with you know the big interest to ruin it for the, for the little guy and, and yeah. stomp on everyone. I think they're just fools. I think they, they think and they, they have too much hubris, and they believe that they can and should govern how very complicated systems work, whether that's, you know, broadly speaking, markets, or whether that's more specifically speaking, Bitcoin. They think that they can and should central plan these things. 
and they're they're wrong. They're, it's morally repugnant of them to do that because they have mm-hmm. to use coercion in order to convince people to do what they think they should, and it doesn't doesn't work. It tends to lead to all sorts of problems. It diminishes economic development. It makes people poorer. It changes the the way that wealth moves around, so it goes into people's pockets who sh- who don't deserve it. Um, and they just they screw things up because of their hubris. And so I'll give them the benefit of the doubt that they are trying to do good. good but if you're trying to do good, if you yeah, if you're trying to do good, convince people that you're doing good. You know, use use reasonable arguments that you're doing good. Get people to join your side voluntarily. If your if your ideas are so great that you have to force them down people's throats, then you're doing something wrong and you're a bad person. Um, and I wish politicians would would see this more often, but of, of course they don't. So this is what we're stuck with. Yeah, Bruce had a great uh, quote from his speech where he talked about like if if the regulators didn't have the monopoly of the use of force and they just had to take their ideas like into a like a, just a regular Bitcoin meetup or something and just and yeah. vocally speak them, they would be laughed out of the room immediately because they're all stupid ideas. Yeah, it's absurd, and it's absurd. And there's no, it's not like, uh, it's not like they could go to a group of normal people, and get a lot of this stuff approved either. I mean, if you took a normal group of people, let them learn about Bitcoin for a while, and then you had Ben Lofty go in front of them and say that he's trying to strip away all their privacy, and he wants to make them just as vulnerable as with the credit card systems. Yeah, they they wouldn't go for it, but he doesn't have to convince people. He doesn't have to convince. The Bitcoiners. He doesn't have to convince the public at large. Uh, he doesn't really have to convince anyone. He has the authority to to write rules that everyone has to follow. Yeah. And if if it's if it's so bad that there's enough political pressure on his superiors to to make a change, then maybe he'll change course. But uh, that that happens a long way after the damage is done. Right. Right. If he wanted to, he could just keep the license requirements as they are right now. And you know, not do any changes over 45 days, and just implement yeah. them. You know, at the end of that, and and that's yeah. that's it. Or make them worse. He he could have released this today, and then when this period of this duration is over, he could release even worse ones. Right. And who? who what's the check? What's where's the check and balance here? Yeah. The, and, and no and, one elected him. And the worst part is this isn't a New York thing. It's not like this only affects uh, people in New York. Because it affects any company that wants to have even a single customer in New York. So, like, if you're if you're a Bitstamp, right? They they must have hundreds of of New York customers, and they now can't work with those people at all. Or if they or decide to go along with the regulation, now they have to apply those mandates to everyone else everywhere else in the world, because they need to know who every single customer is to know if they're a New Yorker. Right. Right. So now, now Ben Lasky's diktats are now imposed on people in the Sierra Leone. So, and they don't they can't vote on they can't vote on Ben Lasky or or Andrew Cuomo, you know, they or anyone in the in the US government. They can't do anything about the US policy. Right. And so the even if you think that a a politician should be able to enact rules and laws upon the people that can vote for him, I don't think many people would agree that you should be able to enact laws that affect people that don't vote for you, right? I mean, this is Taxation without representation. This is kind of how America got started. Was in a uh, uprising against this very idea, and here we are facing it. And uh, people like Ben Lasky seem to think that it's the right thing to do. I mean, what's what's he smoking? <laughs> yeah, like what what is what's the real motivation behind this? Bruce Bruce Fenton seemed to insinuate that you know he's he's corrupt and he might. This might be like a, a ploy by the by the major corporate banks to to co-opt Bitcoin. Would you possibly agree with that? Do you think that it might be possible that this is just the banks trying to co-opt this and and, and regulate virtual currencies out of existence? I or, I think that or? I think that's a kind of a dangerous distraction, and it may be totally true. Ben Lasky might be a completely corrupt guy that's just totally in the pockets of these banks that are. Um, Afraid of Bitcoin. That that might be the case. I don't know, but I don't think it's really important. And if 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 people are going around debating whether Ben Lasky is corrupt and whether this is just uh, from the banks or not, that kind of sidetracks us for the more important point. It doesn't matter whether it's Ben Lasky being uh, thinking he's helping the world and putting in these laws, or whether it's these crony banks that are pressuring him to put in these laws. The laws are bad, regardless of who is 
uh, you know, trying to get them going. We need to attack the laws as they are. It doesn't really matter the motivation. I don't care the motivation of Ben Lasky. I force people to do. And what he's trying to force them to do is wrong. And that, that should be resisted. So let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Let's, let's assume he's a good guy. Okay. He's going to screw things up bad. And so let's address that issue. All right. That sounds, that sounds pretty good. That sounds pretty good. And if he does screw it up pretty bad, Bitcoin system can adapt, create new programs and applications that uh, increase privacy despite the regulations. And, you know, in terms of people living in New York, um, just you'll have to use something else or, 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 you know, hide yourself some way or vote in different yeah. representatives. Yeah, or, yeah, I mean, you'll, you'll figure out ways to get around it. We can look at, you know, what's happening in Venezuela and Argentina right now. Their currencies are falling apart. The government is trying to mandate how people use their money and what money they can use. They put in all these draconian rules, and it's just a joke. People get around them, but in the, in the process, it ends up ruining lives, making people poorer. And everywhere else in the world, we look at, at the Venezuelan government or the Argentinian government and just laugh at them because of how, how inept they are and how, how cruel they're being to try to maintain control. And it's not something that happens in these foreign countries. It's happening here in the United States at the very epicenter of financial business in New York. The exact same thing with capital controls and financial restrictions are happening. Why isn't there a greater outrage about this stuff? Mm -hmm. Well, fortunately, we don't have to just be mad and vote. We can just opt out of this stupid financial system that they want us to use, and we can use Bitcoin. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Opt optimistic point. Um, I want to I wanna get your opinion on um, something that kind of came out on yesterday on the Bitcoin subreddit. Uh, apparently, some people working on Tor have noticed a gigantic Tor node that has popped up in the last three days. And it's literally the, the largest node on the network at this point. And it, it, it only accepts Bitcoin connections, if I understand it correctly. And no one really knows for sure exactly who put it up, who's controlling it. It puts out, it, it has the potential put, to put out like 2.7 um, petabytes of, of, of data per month and and yeah it's me i'm running it on my phone through my verizon uh data plan oh oh nice nice oh, okay. oh great 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 you bad at something <laughs> you covered it i'm gonna have to turn my no I, I i don't know much about about that um obviously it's interesting that it's the largest node and it's only accepting bitcoin traffic yeah um there's you know one of the interesting things about when people can be hidden is that you can do things that if if you had to expose who you were wouldn't wouldn't work. So if there's a cause that someone believes in, you know, they can put up these systems that help further it without exposing themselves personally, which is great. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know how founded this is, but I read a comment um, that said it, it might be possible to uh, censor some transactions on the network if if enough traffic goes through this single node. They might have the ability to censor some transactions. Um, is that a legitimate concern? Uh, that's probably something that in the short term could happen. Like someone could somehow gather lots of traffic and then start censoring things. But Bitcoin is really adaptive. And there's lots of uh, paranoid people always looking at the network and watching things. Yeah. And if that kind of thing happens, people pick it up pretty darn quickly. And people could start routing around those issues. So there's lots of things that in Bitcoin can be short-term problems that long-term get you know, fixed very easily just by right. centralized. And then people start panicking in the short term as well because they're like, "What's going on? I don't know." Um, it, it, and and some some are also speculating that it might be Mike Hearn's node because he's been kind of talking in the past about setting up a node um, for something that he's that he's working on. And then all, other, others are also concerned about whether he wants to um, like kind of taint coins uh, and 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 do surveillance on on part of the network. Do, is that a possibility as well? I, I don't know. I mean, and I don't know what to think of Mike Hearn. I've, from what I've seen of him, he always seems like a, a good guy and he's speaking and talking about the right things. But then I, I hear other too. He's certainly very smart. But then I hear other people saying that he has said this or, or proposed that. And I've never seen that the sources and I'm not investigating it. But um, So I, I, don't, I don't really know what to think of him. But fortunately in Bitcoin, we don't have to, we don't have to worry about any single person. 
if his ideas are good, you know, they'll they'll tend to be adopted into this network, and if they're bad, he'll probably become marginalized over time. All right, great. Yeah, rely on the Bitcoin network and rely not on people. Is that basically your message? All right. I mean, that's why it doesn't matter who Satoshi is. Same reason. Awesome. Yeah, it could be Dorian, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> we haven't heard anything from Dorian in a while. I hope he's doing okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hope he hope he has his life back. Yeah. Um. So, I I, I also want to get your opinion on um some altcoin action that's been happening lately. Um, Ethereum launched a few days ago and started their Genesis sale of Ether. Uh, oh. Do you do you like Ethereum? Do you think it has potential? So Ethereum is by far the most hyped altcoin to have ever existed. Um, that's in part because a lot of the people involved are really smart and I think have a lot of respect in the community. Um, so people pay attention. They also have just really slick branding and it just it looks professional and they, whether orchestrated or whether spontaneous, their marketing and their buzzworthiness has been really good. Um, and I don't know, I don't really know the merits of it. I mean, you know, why markets are great because it can be released and people can risk their capital and time on it. And if it is great, then those people will be rewarded. And if not, then, you know, it'll go away. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. Um, and I don't know what makes it different than something like NXT or some of the other uh, altcoins that have more of a scripting capabilities. So who knows about that? But certainly it's nice to see all this innovation happening. And I guess one of the things that worried me with uh, Ethereum is that they were supposed to release it months ago. Um, mm. And they started getting really worried about regulations. And they started getting worried that if they released it, uh, you know, what jurisdiction it came under and what the founders of it, what risks did they have? And would the uh, crowdfunding be considered an offering of securities, which, you know, would be problematic? So uh, they, they sort of retreated back and, and had to lawyer up and research all this stuff. And um, that's totally understandable that they would want to do that. But to me, that's sort of the opposite of how this cryptocurrency stuff should work. It, it shouldn't. There shouldn't be a point of failure with the founders. You know, it. It shouldn't be that uh, if they release it, a regulator can stamp them out and then Ethereum is gone. Like, it, there shouldn't be that vulnerability. And that was one of the really beautiful things about Bitcoin was that by the time it was known to anyone, there was no central point of failure, and it couldn't be. It couldn't be shut down. It didn't need to seek. It didn't. Satoshi didn't need to research which jurisdiction from from which he should release Bitcoin. It didn't matter. It, it wasn't about a jurisdiction. So that's been something that's concerned me with with Ethereum. But um, hopefully they've they've figured that out and they don't run into any conflicts with the uh, the crowdfunding. Yeah, I didn't I didn't realize that that like they um, that they had to go back and, and deal with regulatory issues before they before they released. I mean that's that's seems kind of weird that they're, they're a system that touts their smart contracts and you're supposed to be able to do any sort of contracts in, in a decentralized way. But if they have to still, you know, deal with regulations and stuff before they even release, like, it, it, seems, it seems ironic at least. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, and, and at least it's, it's sad. Because, you know, I don't know how great Ethereum will be. Maybe it's stupid. Maybe it's the, the next best thing. Let's assume for a second it's the next best thing and it, this amazing innovation that's going to change uh, money and contracts and all this great stuff. And these guys have to hold on, change what they're doing, uh, put things you know on hold and just wait and spend a bunch of money on lawyers because there might be regulations that cause problems for it. I mean, this, this is the real damage that regulations do. It's not just that they say you can't do something and thus people can't do that thing. It's the whole area of uncertainty that it that it creates. Mm -hmm. That you, you don't know how a law will be interpreted. You don't know if something that might be legal today will become illegal tomorrow. Um, laws get, you know, dished out differently to different people, and and that's all that's all terrible for business. I mean, business is hard enough. There's enough risks in business, but to add all this regulatory cloudiness to it, just it just kills it. And you can see. An industry suffocating underneath it, um, and it, it's terrible. And so, you know, people like Ben Lasky, it, 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 this is at their feet. I mean, there are, there are the business people out there building a world, and then there are 
politicians suffocating it. And I'm, yeah. I'm glad that Bitcoin is something global so that even if the politicians in America have completely lost their way, you know, at least the land of the free can move somewhere else. I, I remember last year uh, around November 18th when the Senate first started having their hearings about Bitcoin and virtual currencies. Um, and people were all expecting up until that point like some really negative news, like they're going to basically ban Bitcoin at that point. Then all of a sudden, the politicians yeah. actually kind of liked what they were hearing from panelists like Tony Gallippi from BitPay and other smart people who knew what they were talking about about Bitcoin. And the news was positive. They loved Bitcoin. Well, not loved, but, you know, they were okay with it. They were fine with it. And the price shot up because people were like, wow, we might actually see some good news from government relating to Bitcoin. But now we're actually seeing the, the, the fruit of the government's work, I guess you could, you could call it, their license they're trying to craft, and it's disastrous. Like, we don't want government, um, like, involved this much, trying to constrict what business, what business can, can do with their own funds. Yeah, well, and after those hearings, that, you know, the price went up, I think mainly because everyone in the world sees how, how well, not everyone in the world, many people see how disruptive Bitcoin can be. And the one, you know, gorilla in the room is, will governments just ban it? Will they just take a completely antagonistic view and try to stomp it out? Uh, and if they do, then it's going to be a very long uphill battle. Yeah. So those Senate hearings showed that who knows how the regulations will unfold, but it's going to be a matter of what kind of regulations instead of will they ban it or not. So from that perspective, it's it's fine. I mean, Bitcoin just Bitcoin just grows wherever it wherever it can. And if New York wants to stamp it out in that little on that little island, uh, you know, too bad for them. We'll go around it. <laughs> Adapt. Yeah, just around. yeah. Yeah. So, um, so to close this up, uh, what you would you recommend everyone watching this try and like email, um, email the New York Department of Financial Services, try and comment on this during this 45-day period, see if we can at least get some change to this before it's possibly finalized? Um, yeah, email. If you're going to email, don't be rude. Yes, like yes. Even when you're dealing with evil people, uh, if you come across as evil yourself, then you're, you're not going to get anywhere. So if you're going to email these people, be civil and smart and intelligent in what you say. Um, that's point number one. If you don't want to converse with such people, that's totally understandable too. And that, <laughs> totally understand people that just want to like ignore these kind of folks that's that's fine that's reasonable um, yeah do what you can ultimately just keep building i mean if you have a bitcoin project just just keep building it i mean they, they can't stop a world of builders and uh so that's that's all you really need to do if you want to try to fight them on the political margins go for it but yeah you know build that's build your business tough. that'd be tough to do that. right? Yeah. Write your software, change the world, and uh, the, the politicians will be left in dust anyway. All right. That sounds, that sounds pretty good. Keep working, everyone. Keep building the Bitcoin ecosystem, regardless of whether governments try and regulate it out of existence, try and impose un unnatural surveillance controls on it. Um, just full speed ahead. Yeah. H history will show who was right and who was wrong. Okay. Sounds good. Um Thank you, Eric, uh, for joining me on the Coin Brief podcast. Our first interview. Very exciting. <laughs> Thanks, Sean. Really appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Eric. Yeah. See ya.